now. Section 3.3, .3, nested if statements. Uh, it sounds like one or two of you has a little bit of background noise. If you do mute, if not, I'd love for you to be uh, active and be able to chat. So when we talk about nested if statements, the idea is sometimes I have more than one condition that, that I would like to check. And um, this actually, the example we're looking at follows something called a binary tree. That if you stick with ComSci and you have me for the third or fourth class, you're gonna see how this works. Um, so I wanna now do an if statement. And what you're gonna see is inside the body of the if statement, I can have another if statement if I so desire. So I'm gonna start with a problem and, I, and the problem is gonna be, um, is the animal above water or below water? So if they enter a one, we know that it's above water, okay? Now, if they enter a one and it's above water, inside of there, you're gonna ask for more information and you wanna know if the animal flies you input a one or if it crawls it inputs a two. For example, say if it flies and it's above water, what might your animal be? A bird. A bird, right? If it's above water and it crawls, what might your animal be? Turtle. A turtle, right? So if I was trying to guess what animal you have, you know, I can start to break it down with these questions, but I can also put it in this if kind of format that we've been talking about. Uh, if it belows water, I might ask if it swims, right? So if it swims, it might be a fish. A fish, right? And if it crawls, it might be a lizard. A lizard crawling underwater. I don't care that. Really, crab. I'm thinking crabs, right? I'm thinking Maryland. I'm thinking Old Bay. I'm thinking crabs. Alligator. Yeah, an alligator, right? They crawl underwater too. I don't want to meet an alligator underwater. So, so what am I going to do? As you see the layout that I have provided, I have if, and then I have my Boolean expression to start. So I might want to say if, and uh, let's say this first one or two, you know, I'm going to say, if it's above water, enter one. If it's below water, enter two. So I might say if CH for choice equals one, then I'm gonna get into the body of my if statement. Now you notice again, the body starts with the left brace and the right brace. So inside of here, I could have almost anything. All right, so if it's above water, I might come in and ask again for one or two where the one is, does it fly? Uh, two, if it crawls. And if this time we have uh, choice two equals one, I might be saying, okay, so the user said it's above water and the first choice was a one. Then I ask again, this time uh, the choice was if it flies or crawls. So if the choice two is it flies, then I might be displaying what do we say if it fly the bird? And then I have, if it's not a bird, that means it has to crawl. So I have my else, and now I might want to display a turtle. And you did have a code listing similar to this and how it's embedded. Now, if choice equals one, it does that first block of code with the left and right brace and everything that's inside of it. Now, my second one is just an else, which means if the first choice wasn't a one, it's going to be a two. So this is kind of a default case, right? Now, you could start with, well, what if the user enters three? And well, those are things we're going to have to discuss how to handle later, just not now, okay? So for now, if they didn't choose a one, we're going to assume they chose a two. And I'm going to come into this block that's dealing with the else and say, you know, again, ask for a one or two because, you know, and I can, so I'm doing a little bit of pseudo code here of the layout of how I'd like to program this. Okay. So now I'm going to ask if, um, if choice two this time equals one, 
then I know that it swims and we said display fish and choice two if it crawls I said we're going to display a crab okay so it's a way of nesting ifs inside of my if block right if I say if choice equals one I have a left per, a brace and a right brace I can do almost anything now what's the nice thing about if else blocks I'm skipping blocks of code. So if the choice is two, um, when I come into my if statement, I skip the first however many lines are in that if block. It's a decision that's being made. It's a decision statement. Any questions on the layout of what you see right there? Does this go in infinitely? So say if you had like 10 if else statements, could you just keep going? Well, and that's what's happening here with this next case. So the answer is, Yes, you could keep going. But what you would need to do is put in more ifs. So section 3.4 starts with this if else if. And uh, code listing five was a really good example as far as the layout of how this works. But I'm gonna give you a situation and I'm gonna say, well, if I asked you for your salary, I would have a comment about how much you make. For example, if I asked for your salary and it's greater than $250,000, what might I say? What might I display? If you make over a quarter of a million dollars a year, what might you want to say to somebody? What do you do? Yeah, okay, what do you do? Well, we don't really want to ask a question there. <laughs> so let's not put a question in. Let's go with, um, you know. You're doing good, man. <laughs> yeah, yo doing good. <laughs> If you make over $100,000, what's, what's going on? Not bad. Not bad, right? What about 50000 Better than nothing. Better than nothing. What about 20000 Getting scary. Better than nothing. I thought you were going to say go to college. No. You know I, what I'm saying? I said getting scary. Getting scary. Getting scary else. What happens with the else? What happens if you make less than $20,000? Get a job. Yeah, get a new job. All right, so we're gonna put this into an if statement. And this is where this whole idea of if else ifs work. So I'm gonna start out with my first if and say, if salary is greater than 250,000, with no commas, then I'm going to display um, yo doing good. Yo doing good. Now, if I make $500,000 a year, well, first of all, I'm not um, in my current profession. Uh, so if I make over $500,000, it says if Salary is greater than 250000 Again, I'm not ending that line with the semicolon. My line with the display, I would end with the semicolon. Where does the code go next? So if this was line number one was my if. Line number two was my display. Line number three is going to be my next else if and all the way down. Does it skip everything after yo doing good? No. Yeah, no. It's yeah, it actually would. It'll skip all the way down past the else statement. Okay. My next question, well, if you make greater than 250,000, we're going to display y'all doing good. And then we're going to jump way down in our program past my else, where my else ends. So now that situation is taken care of. So when I come to my next else, if I'm going to now say salary is greater than a hundred thousand and now i'm going to display and amy said not bad again semicolon is going to jump me down past my else statement then i have another one else if let's do the fifty thousand else if salary is greater than fifty thousand 
Again, I'm not ending those. Then I want to put something she said better than nothing. So display better than nothing. I don't know how you spell nothing, but that might be pretty close. Else, uh, we're going to skip to 20,000. Well, why don't we just put else display getting scarier? Getting scary. Okay. So the first one I had if statements inside of if statements, which is fine. The second layout, it's when I have multiple things happening. The classic example is if average is greater than 90, display an A. If average is greater than 80, display a B. If average is greater than 70 and works our way down. This one works just as well. Questions on that layout? No, you're doing a great job. All right, I appreciate that. Yeah, okay. The next thing, we're just rolling it along here. Section 3.5. Now, if you remember the other day, we talked about our relational operators and our relational operators were less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equals not. to, and not equals to. And we had the ever popular statement compares what? Um. Bueller. Bueller. I even wrote it. Somebody say it. Comparisons. Can't read my handwriting. Can no. y'all read when, when I write stuff on here? No. <laughs> but the rest of you have it on speaker view. Is that correct? Yes. So yep. you can see the whole page. Uh, compares expression. The result was bullion. That was all of my if statements. Compares expression result Boolean. Well, today we're going to learn about some more operators. Okay, we have assignment operators. We have relational operators, like I just mentioned. Today we're learning about logical operators. Okay, and we have three of them. Of course, I'm not very good at making my freehand ampersand, but two ampersands represents the logical operator. And again, we're bringing logic into play, another area of math. And it represents and. I have the or, which is two vertical lines side by side. And then finally, I have the exclamation symbol, which represents not. What happens here? Compare Boolean, result Boolean. So what I just have right there is four points on your next test. What we just talked about a moment ago with relational operators, four points on your next test. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to now look at a truth table, some of you are familiar with, and I want to take two variables, and I'm just going to use X and Y, and I'm going to take a look at my combinations. So I have true for X, true for Y, true for X, false for Y, false for X, true for Y, false for X, and false for Y. All right, so let's start with the true. What if I said true anded with true? Again, I'm comparing Boolean. My result is going to be true and true. That would be true. That would be true. What about true or true? True. Still a true. Very good. And finally, what's the not of X? X is true, so the not of true is? False. False, right. And you're going to like that not symbol. In fact, we've already saw it up here with the not equals, all right? All right, true and false. True and it with false. 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 Let's finish this column. False and it with true. False. And false and it with false. False. Good. Coming over to the true. We just did true or true was true. True or false? True. False or true? True. False or false? 
Now, how do you know? Um, with or, it's going to be one or the other or both. So only one of the two conditions has to be true. Okay. So true or with true is true, true or with false, false or with true, right? One or the other or both. And then finally, the not of false would in fact be true. So we set up a little truth table there. I'd like to have that in Braille. <laughs> Well, I would too, but I don't know that I could read it. All right, I am jumping into the textbook and I'm looking at page 141 and I'll read these out as we go. Uh, there's some checkbook examples and I wanna see if we can all get the same answers. All right, not, not looking at the table, we're gonna do these in our head. True and with false. False. Good. True and and with true. 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 And I'm, I'm going to go back and I'm going to say, okay, and is true only when both of them are true. So the next one, when I see false and and with true, I know that's going to be false. And false and and with false, that's going to be false. So this checkpoint 316 would be the same kind of thing as the truth tables we drew, just drove up or drew up. The next four deal with ors. True or false? True. Good. True or true? True. False or true? Either or. Right. So it's true. And then false or false? False. 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 Right. And again, the not of true is false. The not of false is true. They go opposites. All right, so for this next example, 317, I have if A equals 2, B equals 4, and C equals 6. 2, 4, and 6. So now I'm, I'm going to do a combination of the relational operators and the logical operators. So my first question is, again, A is 2. B is four and C is six. Does A equal four or is B greater than two? So let's start with A equal four. Does A equal four? No. That's false. Is B greater than true? Yes. True. So I have false or true. That result is going to be a true. All right, the next one. Is six less than or equal to C? Well, C is six, so what's that become? True. True on the left side. Is A greater than three? A is two. False. That's false. So true and with false is in fact false. All right. Does the order in which they appear matter? They would. They will, and I'm going to talk about, very good question, I'm going to talk about order of operations in a moment. Okay. Okay, but for now, know that we do the relational first, the logic second. Okay. The next one, one not equal to B. Well, let's see, B is four. Is one not equal to four? That's true. That is true. Is C not equal to three? C is six. That's true. True and and with true. That's going to be true. That's going to be true. The next one, I do the left side. A is greater than or equal to negative one. A is two. Is two yeah. greater than or equal to negative one? True. True. Is A less than or equal to B? Is two true. less than or equal to four? True. That's true. True or true gives me? True. Good. The next one is the not of A greater than two. A is two. Is two greater than two? No. That's false. And what's the not of false? True. 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 So that evaluates out as true. All right. So just some quickie practice. Take a look at, at some of those situations. 
All right, so Amy did have a question, and her question dealt with order of operations. And table 310 on page 140 actually talks about the order of operations. Okay, uh, clearly we know parentheses are extremely powerful. And if I want to make sure something gets done first, I do parentheses. Well, in the whole, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, um, the P was parentheses, E was what? Stood for exponents. Do we have exponents? No. Uh, not that I remember. What's the, what's the not of no? What's the not of no? Anybody? True, so True. that's- Yeah, so there true. is. And I think we have something called math.pal. Oh, yes, we do, yeah. That would give us that. So we kind of don't, but in that reference, we do. The next thing that comes up, you start to see multiplication, division, and modulus. They get done. Then addition and subtraction. So, so far, it makes sense. After those operations are done, now we get into our relational operators. And the first four are next in the order of operations. Less than, greater than, less than, or equal to. The next level down is the equals and the not equals. And then finally, the ands get done before the ors. Okie doke. Okie doke. We forgot to mention not. That's way up in the very, very first step. So, hmm. so there is a table that exists in, in the textbook. What page was that? Uh, 140. Are you one that likes to put those sticky tabs in your textbook. No, I just want to do some reading on this stuff. Okay. That was the order of operations. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about and still recording, I'm going to go to, to I'm going to go to share my screen and I'm going to go to write to something that I have in D2L. Um, that I pulled up already, and it's called a skeleton, okay? So I like to use a, can everybody see my screen? No. <laughs> Stop it, Amy. <laughs> okay, so I have my, so I've created something, so I don't get so many syntax errors trying to remember specific syntax. I've created a program lines one through eight are my typical documentation. Name, date, professor, program, purpose. Okay. Line 11, I already have it in. Import Java X dot swing dot J option pane. I know that it's needed for J option pane. So I already have that in. I say public class skeleton. And so I just gave it a temporary name. And if I'm getting ready to work on uh, a program called Olympics, the first thing I would do is come in and change skeleton to Olympics. And then I would do file, save at, file, file, save as, this is theater of the mind, uh, there it went, file, save as, and there's a reason I went and bought a new computer on Friday. And it, well, anyhow, save as and save it as Olympics. Okay. I don't know why it's not letting me save as. Oh, there we go. Um, and I want to save it as Olympics so that when I run it, it will in fact run. Okay. So what else do I have in my skeleton? Once again, I'm getting ready to type a program. I'm going to pull this up first. I have my left brace and then I have my public static void main. I have a brace there that says, a left brace where it says start main. Down below, I have a right brace that says end main. Because again, I'm trying to make sure I don't get my braces messed up. All right, in my declaration section, well, I do so much with in string and out string that I'm gonna declare two variables. String instra equals that's called the null string, double quote, double quote. There's nothing in it. And out string equals this set of double quotes. 
Okay. So I have some stuff in here that if I don't need, I could get rid of. For example, I have an example. Instra, joptionpain.show and put that, enter your favorite number. It's stored in Instra. And I remember I have to do the integer.parse in to put it in there. Okay. I'm getting ready to write a program. I just copy or delete that out and take off. I have my calculation section. I have my output section, which includes outstra equals my favorite number is, and then I have plus number one plus, and then there's my carriage return. And then my next line, outstra equals what was in the string originally, outstra, plus here's my second line to remind me how to put multiple lines to display them in my message box. Down below, after the program is done, I have just some stuff documented that if I ever need it, I could cut and paste it real quick and put it in my program. So if I wanted to, I could come back up here and in my declaration stack section, just leave an in string and an out string. And you know, that's Olympics, Olympics, Olympics. And we'll keep num1. Well, in fact, we're going to change num1 to num gold. And we're going to say, how many gold medals did you win? Hi. Well, I'm not, I'm not ready for input yet. So I need to go back up to my declaration section, number gold. Uh, and what data type should I make that? Int. Yeah, let's make it an int. Okay. That's all I really want to know in this program. But you notice it's a whole lot easier to delete or cut and paste than it is to go book screen, book screen, book screen. You know, a lot of people will have another screen open from another program because you can have multiple programs ready. And then I could do something as simple as, you know, go down to my Outstra and I want to display number of gold. So Outstra number of golds is And, you know, hopefully it would compile. But you notice I had all that yucky stuff already done. And as I learn more and more new things, I may be able to put them down in that bottom section where I had documentation, but just lines of code, like notes to put in there. I won five gold medals. Yay. So I ran my I have code a in. file that I call hodgepodge where I have just a bunch of different bits and pieces of code in it. Okay, same idea. Good, good. And again, you could put, like she said, bits and pieces down here below. Questions? Da -da. There's my hand. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about before I turn you loose on this page 183, number nine, is um, test data. Da, 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 da. Test data. So some of you are now writing a program that you have to do calculations of minutes and text. Okay. So I, I know that I need minutes and text. Okay. So here, give me some idea of what you think that would be good test data. 500 minutes. Good. Zero minutes and <laughs> zero. zero text. Because I'd be willing to bet some of you, when you write 3.1, you input minutes, you input text, you're going to see some sort of negative dollar value. And that's not going to be right. So right away, you know, your calculations are going to be wrong. Another one might be 100 minutes, because that's that first break point, and still zero text. And some of the test data that I use when I go to run your program is going to include this. Another example, 200 minutes and zero text. And, and as you see, I'm creating test data so that I make sure my minutes calculations work. I might want to do now zero minutes and 50 text to see 
what kind of output I'm working. So as soon as I start looking at test data, and as soon as I do the hand calculations, what I want to start to be able to do is take those hand calculations and turn them over into equations. Because as I write those equations down, I'm making what's called pseudocode. And I can take that pseudocode and type it into my program really easy. So I bet about a quarter of my online students had good input, minutes, and text, but their calculations were wrong. Part of that was they didn't create good test data and then come up with equations. Now, if you wanted to, and you did the three companies, what was it, A, A, B, what was it, A, B, and C, um, Tint, and I don't know what the other one was. Horizon. Uh, Horizon, yeah, pretty clever of my, of my part, right? So if I did this and I said, okay, 100 minutes and zero text, here's what the answer should be. Boom, boom, boom. Would I be upset if you went on and ask a fellow mathematician if they got the same thing on the discussion board? I would not be upset. But I bet you if you do this and you start looking at what your answers are supposed to be, our programs are going to be more accurate than not. And like I said, my online class, I, I had quite a few that everything looked great. It's just the answers were wrong. That doesn't do much for the program then. All right, so I want you to now, I'm going to put you in breakout groups. I did a lot of talking today, and we're going to do, um, you, if you have your book in front of you, go to page 183, take a look at number nine.